What has happened everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back today with another one of my top 10 videos and I'm going to be tackling the subject of my top 10 favorite Christmas movies for people who fucking hate Christmas. And if that sounds a little contradictory, allow me to explain. First and foremost, I'm not a complete psychopath. Obviously, I grew as a kid, I loved Christmas. I mean, who doesn't fucking love Christmas when they're a little kid? And my hate of Christmas is more or less kind of, um, I don't know how, how, to, how to put it into words. It's a little bit of like pretending to be Ebenezer Scrooge just as a reaction to what I regard as like the alarming amount of glee and hysteria that some people feel about the holiday of Christmas. And I think it's safe to say that for every person out there who looks forward to this time of year, loves sending out a million Christmas cards, loves sending out a million presents, looks forward to traveling to far too many cities in far too short a time in order to see far too many relatives that they don't like in the first place, you know, nursing all the hangovers, getting in all the screen, screaming matches, just embracing all the undue pressure that is placed upon people during this time. But I feel like there are just as many other people where they look upon all that with horror, and it's a time of depression and dread and stress. And yeah, I just, I hate the whole season, but... When you hand a present to a small child and their eyes light up with glee, obviously, that's a wonderful, beautiful thing. Like I said, I'm not a fucking psychopath. I just, I hate, I think I hate more than anything, people who like Christmas too much as adults as opposed to just letting it be something for the kids. Because what it leads to are like really annoying office parties that you have to attend or bonding with relatives that you only see at like the annual Christmas party but otherwise you do not you do not give a shit about them and i really hate like cheesy just grotesquely commercial christmas music like when a boy band comes out with their christmas like their new christmas album and it's not even like their version of old school Christmas songs. It's like new Christmas songs, like in sync. I, I used to have to listen to the fucking in sync Christmas album 20 years ago because my sisters were into it. And I was like, sing fucking jingle bells, but don't give me some new cheesy goddamn pop tune that you just pulled out of your ass. That's the side of Christmas that I fucking despise. And there are times where I feel like if I could just place myself in like a medically induced coma and skip Christmas every year, I would be a happier person. But what I hate more than all the other crap I already mentioned are really bad Christmas movies where these are movies that prey upon people's emotions and they resort to really cheap sentiment or like nauseatingly syrupy bullshit that's totally manipulative going for these unearned emotional beats, usually with, accompanied by terrible music or and or including really annoying children just spouting out a bunch of bullshit and it just it all makes me want to projectile vomit right out of my ass i can't fucking stand it and every year we get like 50 new christmas movies that perfectly exemplify what i'm describing so you might be asking yourself a very fair question at this point what qualities would allow a film to make this list and it's more about what they're not than what they are like if you would describe the movie as cute it's not going to make this list. But I feel like there's a whole crop of movies out there that take place during Christmas that are not about Christmas that are really good fucking movies. And most of the movies on this list have been celebrated before. There are, there are no like hidden surprises tucked away in here, although a few of them are a little more obscure. And I just feel like for, if you find yourself trapped at a family gathering where you just want to... I don't know, like put poison in everybody's eggnog. Instead, watch one of the movies on this list and I think you'll be feeling a lot better in no time. These are movies that are designed to help bitter assholes survive this unendurable season. And like any good top 10 list, there's not enough room for all the movies that I would want to include, which is always a sign that the list is worth making. But just to show that I'm not a completely, totally cold-hearted bastard, if I were to make a genuine top 10 Christmas movie list like of movies that actually celebrate Christmas, there are a bunch of good ones out there. Like I would include the original animated Boris Karloff, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, uh, the stop-motion movie, The Nightmare Before Christmas, Christmas Vacation, A Christmas Story, Edward Scissorhands, Scrooged. There are a lot of good ones out there. Can't see the line, can you, Russ? No. And of course, there's It's a Wonderful Life, which always gets described as a Christmas movie, usually by people who have not seen the movie. 
I love Frank Capra. Frank Capra was a damn good filmmaker, and I think It's a Wonderful Life is his strongest movie. But that movie's about so much more than just Christmas. Christmas shows up at the very end of the movie, but it's about depression, and it's about a guy wondering what would the world have been like had he never been there. It's a movie about suicide. I mean, it's a really grim, incredible film. But by the very end, when it does turn into a legit Christmas movie with those clips that we've all seen in movies like Gremlins with Jimmy Stewart running down the street screaming Merry Christmas to everybody, or when his little girl says, every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings, it's a very real, genuine, heartfelt scene and the emotions are earned. It's an incredibly emotionally impactful scene. But let me get into a few honorable mentions before I get into my top 10. And as is always the case when I think of these ideas for a top 10 list, I'm like, oh, what is like a really quick, easy idea where I can do no research? And then as soon as I start doing the preparation, I always end up doing far too much research and going down a rabbit hole and looking at other lists and that sort of thing, like a movie like the the Osploitation classic Wake and Fright. I never would have thought of it as a Christmas movie, but it popped up on somebody else's list, so I probably need to revisit Wake and Fright just to see what people are talking about. But then we have great horror movies like Black Christmas, which, which is a really phenomenal early 70s horror film from the same guy who made A Christmas Story about 10 years later. But if it horrors your thing, Silent Night, Deadly Night is another good one. If you like kind of rough and rowdy 90s edgy comedies, The Ref is uh, definitely a dark Christmas movie worth seeing. It falls just shy of being a movie as ruthless as like Swimming with Sharks, but it's still pretty goddamn good. Go, well worth a look. Uh, Todd Haynes' Carol is a very cool kind of unofficial Christmas movie with some really frank eroticism, which always makes a movie okay in my book. Or if you prefer to stick with the great masters, Ingmar Bergman's Fanny and Alexander will absolutely blow your mind. It's one of his great masterpieces. And if you're one of those people who appreciates a little acid and venom in their humor, I strongly recommend Martin McDonough's In Bruges, a film which is now just a genuine, bona fide cult classic. And another acidic Christmas classic is Billy Wilder's The Apartment. It doesn't really feel like a Christmas movie, but a lot of it does take place during Christmas, and it's a strong contender for the best film that Billy Wilder ever wrote or directed. And one of the best honorable mentions in a strong contender for my top 10 is Terry Gilliam's Brazil from 1985, which is one of the funniest and just most scathing social satires in human history. A movie that just completely skewers every single aspect of late 20th century life. It's basically bureaucracy run amok, controlling nearly every aspect of society. And the movie is eerily prescient in that Every single era has people who are trying to create the hellish existence that is being explored in that movie. That is your receipt for your husband. Thank you. And this is my receipt for your receipt. And there are a few out there that I still need to see. I've never seen Morvern Caller, which I understand is a brilliant movie, irrespective of whether or not it's a Christmas movie or not. And Better Watch Out, apparently, is pretty cool as well. But at this point, the video is going to be two and a half hours long if I don't start talking about the fucking movie. So let's get into my number 10 and I have to thank the boys over at The Pink Smoke. Definitely check out their website for cluing me into this movie years ago when they came on my podcast, Wrong Reel, to talk about it. But I'm talking about John Cribbs and Christopher Funderburg. They know their stuff. But the movie is The Silent Partner from 1978. Now, this movie is not about Christmas at all. However, it does take place during Christmas. I mean, it even has a bank robber dressed up as Santa Claus, and it's got Christmas parties and the whole deal. So once again... If there are a lot of scenes set around Christmas, then you can totally qualify for this list. But this is about bank robbers and kind of con artists and bank tellers all collaborating, trying to outwit one another and playing a very dangerous game of cat and mouse. It's a really kind of savage, unexpectedly violent movie in a lot of ways. And Curtis Hansen was one of the screenwriters of the, uh, the movie. Curtis Hansen would go on to do movies like L.A. Confidential, which blew my mind when it came out back in the 90s and he also was an uncredited director on this alongside Daryl Duke but the stars Elliot Gould, Christopher Plummer and Susanna York are just absolutely incredible but what I like about this movie is that it is like the most unapologetically frank movie about adult sexuality that I've ever seen and you know there are plenty of movies about sex where it's like a bunch of frat guys going to titty bars going woohoo and it's like that's not what I'm talking about I'm talking about people like in their 30s and 40s, consenting adults who enjoy a nice roll in the hay and they're not ashamed to admit it and go to parties wearing t-shirts like bankers do it with interest. I mean, that alone wins me over. But it's just, it's the horniest Canadian cult classic, I think, that I've ever seen. 
and it's definitely the perfect medicine for the Christmas season blues. But let's move on to my number nine, a movie which I just saw for the first time, Deadly Games Dial Code Santa Claus from 1989. It's actually a French Christmas movie, and you can find it on Shudder. It's available right now. And sometimes the movie just goes by the name Deadly Games, but it's also listed as 36.15 code Père Noël. That's the French title. In any event, this movie is basically Home Alone for people who find Home Alone to be too sentimental. And I do find Home Alone to be too sentimental. Even when I was a kid, I guess I was 15 when that movie came out. Even then I found it to be too sentimental, too soft and sugary and sweet. But this is a movie about a kid defending his home from a murderous sociopath who's dressed up as Santa Claus on Christmas Eve. And imagine like a late 80s kid who knows his 80s action well and like basically dreams of being John Rambo and like knowing how to set booby traps and that sort of thing, who lives inside an exotic mansion, almost like like a supervillain's base with all these different chambers and rooms. But this psycho shows up and starts harassing this kid and his grandfather, and the kid just goes fucking berserk and resorts to every single uh, secret weapon in his toolkit to make this poor guy's life hell. But there's so many brilliant scenes that are basically like oh, loving homages to 80s action classics where it totally leans into like these classic R-rated action tropes like burying your dog and then like gripping the dirt and roaring and like strapping on plastic weapons and tying a headband on. Anyway, Sylvester Stallone, if you ever saw this, I'm sure he would absolutely fucking love it. But it's basically like, what if Die Hard starred a little kid and took place in a house with one henchman trying to kill him? And it's not one of those movies that starts out hard and then gets soft. Like that happens to so many movies like Scrooge. Starts out ruthless and then gets very sugary sweet. Deadly Game sticks to its guns all the way through. It will make you laugh your goddamn ass off. So shout out to director and writer Rene Manzor who did this. He absolutely knocked it out of the park. Now, I already mentioned Die Hard in the context of the previous films, so let's just dive right into Die Hard from a number eight. A movie that people like to debate whether or not it's a Christmas movie, and I feel like, I don't know, I mean, if people want to debate it, fine, but the movie takes place during Christmas. It has Christmas parties, Christmas presents, like, you know, kids waiting for their parents to come home on Christmas Eve when John McClane's got a, a weapon taped to his back. We hear little jingle bells. It's a Christmas movie. Is it about Christmas? No, it's a just most badass fucking action movie of its era. But it's so weird how people just, people the same way people make up bullshit for themselves to do during the Christmas holiday, people just like to make up shit to fight about for the, the dumbest fucking reasons. But at any rate, Die Hard is a Christmas movie for people who hate Christmas movies. And it's so goddamn good and has such a great happy ending that it almost crosses over into like a legit Christmas movie that could make a list that would include movies like A Christmas Story, but that's one of those classic action movies that 100% lives up to its reputation, and it's rare to see an action movie where the hero is always in so much trouble. Just seeing John in the bathroom with blood pouring out of his feet, knowing that his own death is potentially right around the next corner, and just seeing he's so exhausted, and he's just so... He's, He's got nothing left to give, but he has to just keep going. It's totally badass, and I feel like that kind of action is something that's kind of a lost art form. We see too many action movies where the people are just indestructible. Give me some more Die Hard, please, in the action genre. But let's move on to my number seven, which allows me to celebrate the great Stanley Kubrick in his film Eyes Wide Shut from 1999. And I'll never forget the spring of 1999, which was my last year in college, and I was really looking forward to this movie, and Stanley Kubrick was then and is still today one of my all-time favorite filmmakers. He's just an absolute giant. And my buddy and I were sitting there watching TV, and another friend walked in and just told me that Stanley Kubrick had died, and I was like, are you fucking with me? And he was like, no. I was like, I was like, if you're fucking with me, I'm, I'm going to like get in a fight with you right now. And he's like, I'm serious. He's like, I just saw in the news that, that he died. And obviously I was sad to hear that one of my favorite filmmakers was dead at 70, but but the the immediate panic that set in, I was like, oh my God, what is Warner Brothers going to do to the movie? Like, are they going to recut it? Are they going to fuck with it? Are, gonna, are they going to screw it up? And I think to my dying day, I will always suspect that Eyes Wide Shut is unfinished. I feel like Kubrick probably would have continued to edit and sound mix and finesse it right up until the last minute. I don't know how much he would have changed, but there was still some time left in the post-production process and so I always kind of 
watch the movie somewhat at arm's length, wondering if it's like the real Stanley Kubrick, eyes wide shut. But the reality is it has a lot of really interesting scenes set during Christmas. And I find the, the, the famous orgy scene in it famously or notoriously unerotic. I mean, I've never seen a scene with so many beautiful women wearing nothing where it's not like a turn on. It's like you almost are like, it's almost like being at the zoo and you're going, oh, that's interesting. But the scenes that I do find to be erotic are the dream sequences, or I guess the fantasy sequences, where Tom Cruise is thinking about what Nicole Kidman might have done. Like he's having this, almost like he's working himself into a, up into a frenzy, imagining his wife getting it on with this kind of rugged sailor guy, a guy that she never even got it on with. But those scenes for me are intensely erotic. But what I like about this movie is that it's given me the perfect Halloween costume for the rest of my life because you put on a tuxedo, you put on a Venetian mask, and wherever you go, you fit right in. And at a certain point, if you're tired of wearing a mask, you take it off, you're still in a tuxedo. You can still get into any bar or restaurant in New York. And as far as how it ranks relative to other Stanley Kubrick movies, I don't rank it near the top of his filmography. I, mean, I much prefer films like Full Metal Jacket or Barry Lyndon or Pads of Glory. I, mean, I guess I really like his war movies, but I also love The Killing and Lolita. And anyway, he's got from basically The Killing up through Full Metal Jacket. I like them all, and I like Eyes Wide Shut too. I just don't think it's quite as strong as the rest. But this is not a Stanley Kubrick uh, filmography video. This is a uh, Christmas movie list for people who hate Christmas. So let's push on to a movie that has built, like, also like Die Hard, finally been embraced as an unofficial Christmas movie. But I'm talking about Batman Returns from 1992. And for younger fans of superhero movies out there, it's going to be tough to put this into words, but there was a time where superhero movies were very rare, and a good superhero movie was even more rare. I mean, the 80s was just a fucking no man's land for uh, for uh, for superhero movies. I mean, we had Superman 2, which is good, and we had Batman in 1989. And that was about fucking it. But we had all these other great genres that were being explored. I mean, great horror and great action and basically every other kind of movie that you could think of. Great science fiction, yada, yada, yada. But 1989, Tim Burton's Batman changed the game, monster hit. Batman Returns. A lot of people did not like it at the time of its release, but I was so just enthralled by Tim Burton's vision that I was like, this guy can do no wrong. And even if I found the tone to be a little weirder and a little sillier, there was no getting around the fact that Michelle Pfeiffer delivered one of the all-time great performances in any genre, and she just looked absolutely fantastic. And when people say, like, how is this a Christmas movie? Well, the Penguin is given away by his parents or abandoned or thrown away on Christmas. And it's got a famous Christmas tree sequence where uh, the Penguin kills a girl and Batman flies over the crowd. And most important of all, every time Batman and Catwoman get it on, it's underneath mistletoe. So it absolutely qualifies as a Christmas movie. And it's so uncompromising in its depiction of some pretty raunchy sexuality or at least sexually suggestive dialogue just the pussy i've been looking for i would love it if the superhero genre would give us some more disturbing weird gothic movies like this <clears throat> sorry i'm losing my voice and i'm only halfway through the video so maybe we ought to just move on to my number five the hunt from 2012 from director thomas venterberg Thomas Vanderberg uh, gave us The Celebration in the late 90s, which is an absolute masterpiece, and he recently gave us Another Round, which is one of my favorite movies. I think, was that 2019 or 20? I can't remember what year that came out. But anyway, an Another Round was fucking fantastic. But The Hunt is really special. It might be Thomas Vanderberg's strongest film. It stars the legendary Mads Mikkelsen, who won the Best Actor Award at the Cannes Film Festival. And I don't want to give away too much of the plot, but here you have a guy who is a very well-intentioned, hardworking kindergarten teacher. He works with small kids. He's got he leads a very kind of quiet, calm life, but he's good at what he does. And there's a little girl who absolutely loves and adores him, and they have a great relationship. And one time, she decides to kiss him on the mouth, like. I mean, kids do weird shit. And he very calmly and very politely says, you know, that's inappropriate. Like, little girls should not be kissing adult men on the mouth, blah, blah, blah. And as she's trying to describe to her parents and to other people what happened because she's five, I mean, she kind of garbles the official version of events. And what it leads to is just this domino effect where 
He loses his job. His entire town starts to hate him. People just start rejecting him left and right. People are trying to murder him left and right. I mean, like, it gets so violent and so ugly and so nasty so quickly. And he's innocent. He is completely, totally innocent. We see the scene that is in question. It's not like the movie cuts away and lets us wonder the whole movie. We know this guy is being treated completely, totally unjustly. And he just refuses to give ground. People attack him at the grocery store. He just goes. If he goes to the, if, he's, if people are going to scream at him at church, he still just goes. He lives his life, and he just keeps telling. And also, the the father of the little girls, one of his closest friends, he's like, "I did not fucking do this." It's a remarkable movie of enormous emotional power. And when you know, ten years later, cancel culture has become such a weird, strange thing online where people enjoy a public shaming or a public hanging. I mean, since the days of hanging people in public, people have enjoyed watching other people suffer publicly because they're like, at least it's you and it's not me. And I just think The Hunt is a brilliant examination of that whole phenomenon. But let's switch gears to a much more happy-go-lucky and friendly topic. Let's talk about my number four, Trading Places from 1983. Now, I have to give another brief history lesson to all the youngins out there, but a long time ago, in a bygone era, Hollywood used to make these really cool things called comedies, and they were cheap to make, and they made people laugh, and they made lots and lots of money. So thank God Hollywood finally decided to you know, learn the error of their ways and overcame that moral shortcoming and stopped making these naughty comedies that make people laugh. And obviously, I'm laying on the sarcasm pretty thick, but... The comedy is a great lost genre in the world of movies. It's thriving in the world of stand-up right now. I mean, there's so many astonishingly good comedians, almost because they realize at a time where there's so few laughs to be found, it's the best time possible to get get up on a stage with a microphone and make people laugh. And Trading Places is one of those comedies where I might have seen it more than any other comedy ever made. And there are a bunch of other contenders, but I started watching Trading Places back when it came out. And nearly 40 years later, I'm still watching it, and it still makes me laugh every goddamn time. You've got Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd at the absolute peak of their creative powers, and you've got Jamie Lee Curtis, and she's so sexy in this. I think she made an entire generation of kids start puberty early with some of the scenes in this flick. I mean, good God, that is a Hall of Fame 80s nude moment, but... This is one of the most quotable comedies ever made, and both in my family as well as my circle of friends growing up, you could have entire conversations with people just quoting comedies, whether it was Billy Madison or Dumb and Dumber or The Big Lebowski or Caddyshack or whatever the case might be. But if I'm hanging out with my siblings at Thanksgiving dinner and I say something like, It ain't cool being no jive turkey so close to Thanksgiving. They will know what I'm talking about, and they will laugh uproariously. Or... If you're hanging out at a lake or the beach or whatever, and if I look at my dad and say, looking good, Billy Ray, he'll immediately respond, feeling good, Lewis. I mean, he knows exactly what I'm talking about. Or even little moments like, I'm ready for you, Billy Ray. If you know the movie, you know the scene that I'm talking about. But this is one of the funniest movies ever made. And of course, there are loads of people out there now who say, oh, it's it's problematic for this reason or that reason. All those people probably don't tell a lot of jokes, nor do they laugh all that frequently. If you want to know what are good, funny movies, ask people who enjoy laughing, and they will probably be a better guide. So, Trading Places, if you've not seen it, go hunt it down. It will make you shit your pants. <coughs> and I got so carried away talking about the comedy that I forgot to mention, it does have a lot of great scenes that take place during Christmas. I think it's one of the best Christmas movies ever made, but also one of the most disturbing. A little kid watching Dan Aykroyd eating salmon through his beard and pulling up at it. About made me puke, and it just made me like really sad and upset. Anyway, I was seven, but it, at any rate, it totally qualifies as a Christmas movie. But let's move on to my number three. I'm gonna break my format, and I'm not going with, with uh, one movie for my number three because there is a writer and a director out there who really loves Christmas, who includes it in almost all the movies that he either writes or directs. And of course, I'm talking about Shane Black. Shane Black at one time was the highest paid screenwriter out there and wrote a lot of damn good movies. And if I had to pick one, I'm probably going to go with The Lethal Weapon. I've definitely seen The Lethal Weapon more than any of his other movies. Tell me, what day is it? What day is it? Goddamn Christmas! 
But across his entire filmography, Shane Black is always including scenes involving Christmas in movies like The Long Kiss Goodnight, Iron Man 3, The Nice Guys, and Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. And I feel like Kiss Kiss Bang Bang kind of gets slept on a little bit. But if you want to see a great scene involving Christmas, Michelle Monaghan dressed up as an elf, stripping down to go to bed and letting Robert Downey Jr. hop in the sack with her for some non-sexual cuddling. Oh, dear God. But... I don't know if there's anybody out there who likes Christmas more than this particular filmmaker, so obviously Shane Black had to get a big shout-out on this list. And I'm noticing a recurring theme throughout this list is that a lot of these are very sexual movies. I guess maybe that's the perfect antidote to the sugary, sweet, innocent bullshit that you see in so many Christmas movies. If you actually have adults getting it on, it kind of bounce things out and brings things back to like kind of an, an even keel. Or maybe I just like seeing sex in movies, which I do not make any apologies for. But here is a movie from a number two, which has none of that. I'm talking about Gremlins from 1984. And Gremlins starts out in a style and a tone that ordinarily would make me like, I guess, like afraid that it's going to turn into one of those god awful shitty Christmas movies that fills me with loathing and horror, but around the 25 minute mark, it starts to pivot and starts to change. And it becomes just a genuine classic. And it helps that I was eight when I saw this in the theater, fell in love with it, seen it many times since. But this is one of those movies that alongside Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom was credited with inspiring the Motion Picture Association of America to create the PG-13 rating in the first place. It was one of those tweeners. It's too freaky and weird to be a PG movie, but it's not fucked up enough to be an R. And while I feel like PG-13 was very appropriate both for this as well as Temple of Doom, I hate the PG-13 rating. I feel like either go all R or all PG, but PG-13 movies today are just, I feel like they're just, they're masquerading as movies that are more intense than they actually are, but Gremlins totally earns its PG-13 rating. Written by Chris Columbus, produced by Steven Spielberg, and they almost hired Tim Burton to direct this, but they went instead with Joe Dante, who was hot off of the film The Howling, as well as his segment of The Twilight Zone, the movie, which Spielberg was also involved in. And Joe Dante just absolutely knocked this out of the park. It was the number four highest grossing movie of the year. It opened up against fucking Ghostbusters and did just fine. And it's funny how Joe Dante still to this day has no idea why this movie went on to become a bona fide commercial success. And I just rewatched the movie last night, and as I was watching it, you could really see it being pulled like Laffy Taffy in two different directions. There's the original script where you've got these monsters that fucking scratch people and kill people and rip them apart. I mean, people forget just how ruthless and violent and disturbing a lot of scenes in Gremlins are. And then you have the soft and fuzzy stuff that was kind of shoved in to make it more accessible. But for whatever reason, it works, even though those scenes in theory should clash. Like at the very end, shots of Gizmo in an electric car riding around doesn't even make any sense because you need the remote control to make an electric car go. But at any rate, if you suspend your disbelief, that's the climax of the movie, and it should be a movie for like four-year-old kids, but somehow it doesn't completely break the tension and the tone because you've got Stripe shooting arrows at Billy and just like coming after him with chainsaws. I mean, it's, like I said, this movie is really hardcore. And if you're a giant film nerd, there are all these great clips playing throughout the movie, like scenes from It's a Wonderful Life, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, even John Cocteau's Orpheus. I mean, that's a really deep cut for a kind of a mainstream monster movie. But if I were to try to zero in on the qualities as to why this movie works so well, first and foremost, Jerry Goldsmith wrote not one, but two two iconic theme songs for this movie. You've got the Mogwai theme song, which Gizmo sings, but you also hear just on the score. And you've also got the Gremlin theme, which is just so iconic. I mean, it's, it's awesome. And then you have the scene in the kitchen where Billy's mother, like in Texas Chainsaw Massacre fashion, just eviscerates three gremlins, one after another, like a fucking blender, a goddamn microwave, and another one just gets stabbed <laughs> repeatedly with a kitchen knife. I think that's one of the most badass scenes from any movie in that entire decade. It is a masterclass in filmmaking and really fucking hardcore. But the reason this movie is at number two on this list is because it's got the all-time great best scene describing why some people aren't into Christmas. 
And throughout the movie, Phoebe Cates had already been kind of laying a trail of breadcrumbs as to why she didn't like the holiday. And she raises a very interesting point where if you don't celebrate any other holiday, nobody cares. But if you say you don't celebrate Christmas, people kind of look at you like you have six heads. I want to put forward the idea that when people are adults take Christmas too seriously, that is just as fucking weird as people who don't like Christmas at all. Like if you're 50 and you spend your whole life kind of getting prepared for Christmas and you let your tree sit in your living room and rot until fucking March after the holiday's over, like people just really just wallow in it and milk it for everything they can. I think that's actually much weirder than people who don't like Christmas at all. But in this movie, about two thirds of the way through, she delivers just this show stopping. I guess almost like a soliloquy as to why Christmas fills her with horror. And she describes the scene as a little girl where her father broke his neck coming down the chimney dressed as Santa Claus. And she says, and that's how I discovered there, that, that there is no Santa Claus. And it's just, first and foremost, is like I can't imagine how many kids learned that Santa does not exist because of this movie. I learned when I was in kindergarten and I was in second grade when this movie came out. So I'd, I'd already had it uh, kind of spoiled by my older brother. But I bet a lot of kids were like, Mom, Dad, like what the fuck? But anyway, it's a brilliant scene. It's bone chilling. There's not a monster in sight. And Phoebe Cates just absolutely knocked it right out of the park. And famously, Steven Spielberg, as well as the studio, wanted to have that entire scene removed. But Spielberg, in spite of not liking the scene, backed his director Joe Dante all the way. So high five to Steven Spielberg for being a damn good producer, in addition to being a really good filmmaker. But let's move on to my number one, and it's a no-brainer, Bad Santa from 2003. For everybody who likes going to like ugly Christmas sweater parties, or for people who start putting up their tree and decorating it like in early November, like or you walk into a store in mid-October and they're already playing Christmas music trying to sell you shit. For all those fuckheads out there, Bad Santa is the perfect retaliation because it is the exact polar opposite of all those emotions and instincts. This is just a ruthless, foul-mouthed, lean and mean comedy with a bunch of comedy giants. The film stars Billy Bob Thornton, Tony Cox, Bernie Mac, John Ritter, and Lauren Graham. And it just makes me fucking howl. And I won't say which person this was because I don't want to throw them under the bus, but I was watching watching this with my family, I think, two years ago. And some people were in various states of altered consciousness. And one kept coming to him going, what movie is this? And I was like, shut the fuck up. Go back to sleep. It's Bad Santa. Like You're so goddamn stupid. But at any rate, this is the perfect movie to watch when you just have had too much Christmas and you're ready to get shit-faced and flip the double bird to the entire world and tell everybody to go fuck off because the movie is so refreshingly profane where I feel like if I were to start quoting the movie, I might get suspended from YouTube indefinitely. It's just ruthless. And while the official screenwriters of the movie are Glenn Ficarra and John Requa, it had an unofficial rewrite from director Terry Zwigoff as well as Joel Cohen and Ethan Cohen. And I think that's where you get the real sizzle for this steak. And Joel and Ethan Cohen, obviously, they're some of the best filmmakers alive. They've made many great movies with that use that utilize very good screenplays. And it makes you wonder what might have been if the Cohen brothers had decided to ghostwrite and or script doctor more projects. But I think what always brings me back to this, I mean, it's great seeing Billy Bob Thornton getting hammered and getting it on with Lauren Graham. And I mean, all those scenes are fucking hysterical. But I think what really sells it for me are the scenes between Bernie Mac and John Ritter, where you have two totally different styles of comedy that are like, like somehow perfect dance partners. Where like Bernie Mac, he's got this delivery style where he's so still and so confident, and he's almost doing nothing, but somehow he just makes you shriek with laughter. I'm not advocating celibacy. Hope not. It'd be the end of fucking human race. Yeah. Fuck large women. But as I mentioned before, Trading Places, I, I miss seeing great, foul-mouthed, disgusting comedies. And Bad Santa has so many great lines, like during a big butt sex sequence, like t Billy Bob telling a girl, like, you're not going to shit right for a week. I mean, that is just so goddamn gnarly. And I don't know why somebody hasn't pick up, picked up the baton and run with it. Because if the powers that be in Hollywood are too afraid to greenlight foul-mouthed comedies... And maybe Netflix would be willing to, but I feel like it's time for some independent filmmakers to 
notice a giant market opportunity and bring back that genre that has brought so much joy to so many people. And it wasn't that long ago. I can remember around like 2006, 2007, 2008, where movies like Borat and Wedding Crashers and The Hangover were not only successful, but like wildly successful. And I feel like filmmakers and Hollywood in particular, we know they're all a bunch of greedy fucks. Who would turn down hundreds of millions of dollars in order to like avoid offending people? I guess the reality is that's just where Hollywood is right now. But at a certain point, you would think that greed would just kick back in and people would dust that genre off and make it sing again. But if you are missing the comedy genre as much as I am, check out Bad Santa again and it will make your holiday feel complete. But that brings my list to a close. I hope you enjoyed some of my recommendations. And don't take my comments about Christmas too seriously. I mean, once again, I like poking fun at Christmas because people take it way too seriously. But if I'm at a cocktail party and somebody throws in Nat King Cole and he starts singing Christmas songs, I get just as moved and sentimental as anybody. Or if I hear the soundtrack to the Charlie Brown Christmas, if you look real closely, you might see a little tear in the corner of my eye. And if suddenly the whole world decided that they just despise Christmas, the first thing I would probably do is a top 10 Christmas movie for people who fucking love Christmas. But because this is the holiday season, I hope you'll forgive a little bit of advertising from Manscaped, the official sponsor of my podcast, Wrong Real. It's never too early to play holiday music, and it's never too early to start thinking about gifts. Whether it's for a friend or the friends in your pants, you can make this a season to be jolly with Manscaped. Do your little drummer boy a favor and use the Lawnmower 4.0 to avoid another silent night in the bedroom. Then add in Manscaped's top-of-the-line shower products to have the people thinking, all I want for Christmas is you. Santa cares about his sack, and so should you. Look nice when you get naughty by going to manscaped.com and using the discount code WRONGREAL in all caps for free shipping and 20% off. Inside, you'll find the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, weed whacker, ear and nose hair trimmer, crop preserver, ball deodorant, crop reviver toner, performance boxer briefs, and a travel bag to hold your goodies. Think of it as the perfect package for your package. So that's all i got to say for now. Hope you enjoyed enjoyed the video. If you have other recommendations, definitely let me know. I'm always up for watching cool Christmas movies that don't completely wallow in the gross side of the Christmas spirit. But if you want to tell me how wrong I am, hunt me down on Twitter at Geeking Out. And remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell. But more importantly, as always, well, first of all, Merry Christmas, but also onwards and upwards.